Okay, let's talk about uh, Picasso's great painting, Still Life with Chair Caning, from 1912. It's barely a painting at what all. What makes it great? <laughs> That's a very question. good question. I think this is actually, in many ways, this painting, it looks at least like a disaster. What's great about it is the ideas that he's thrown into this painting. Yeah, so since it's not so beautiful to look at, I guess we have to talk about the ideas. So. Um, where what, we well, start? why isn't it beautiful? What do you want from a painting for it to be beautiful? My big problem with why this is not beautiful is that it's all gray and brown. It's my big problem with analytic cubism generally. I like color. This is why people walk by these paintings in the museum and they say, I know that's important, but do I have to look at it? Also, all of these analytic cubist paintings tend to look the same. So how does one then enter into the painting and stop and pay attention? How do you, what's the entree into this painting? Well, it's pretty arresting. I mean, if you were seeing this in, in, the, in the museum as opposed to on a computer screen, um, the first thing you would notice is that only the top and the right side of the canvas, that is only this area here and this area here, are really paint. The entire bottom left part of the, of the canvas is this other material, which is called oil cloth. Has had anyone ever... Um, Introduced oil cloth on a had you know put oil cloth on a painting before? Well, Brock had, but just recently, and before that, of course not. And the reason that, of course not, is because oil cloth was the cheapest material. Right, one. You, you buy it at like Woolworths. It's like contact paper. It's the stuff you line your shelves with right. or use a, on a cheap table so you can wipe up spills. Hardly high art kind of material. So what does that mean? I mean, what is that? What is that suggesting Picasso is doing here? He's he's. He's making art into garbage. Into trash. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Or vice versa. Or trash into art. Right. Absolutely. But again, how does one enter into this without understanding all of those things which are arcane to the common viewer? I don't think one does. I think this painting only becomes great when one understands its place in the history of art. I don't think that Picasso actually expected many people to look at this painting in the first place. And then, if they did, I, I think that he was he was speaking to a very small audience. How big is this painting? It's um, it's a, uh, less than two feet across. So is it about the size of a table? It's about the size of a table, and that's exactly what it is. In fact, we're really looking at a kind of at a kind of breakfast at a kind of breakfast table. Um, and what we're putting up on the screen now, what you're seeing is um, on the upper right uh, a detail of the of the still life with chair caning. But I guess let's just stop and even just say what this chair caning is in this oilcloth business. On on the left, you can see some rolls of of oilcloth that are for sale, and you'll notice that there's a printed pattern on them. And below, oilcloth being used as a tablecloth, the printed pattern that Picasso bought in a hardware store. Um, as if he had gone to Home Depot or something and, and bought this material, um, had printed on it a photograph of, well, it wasn't really a photograph, but a drawing of, of chair caning. So this sort, of, this sort of repetitive pattern. And then he takes it and he literally just glues it down onto his canvas and then paints over it. What's interesting to me is that the chair caning in the painting has, is incredibly illusionistic and looks like, you know, really looks like the chair caning on this chair. So let me ask you then, is Picasso cheating? In, historically, we've always tied, you know, um, the, the notion of the conceptual and the sort of the great artist to his ability to, to render, or her ability to render um, uh, illusionistically. And so is Picasso cheating by going out and buying this factory-made, reproduced material and sticking it into the painting and saying, I don't have to paint this anymore? Well, and not only that, but this, you know, the idea of of skill and greatness being calculated by how well one renders reality becomes sort of moot because machines can print reality on cheap stuff and you can buy it at Home Depot. So why so would an artist was this need a, to do it? Obviously this is a discussion that we wouldn't have today because we would never consider that cheating, taking found objects. Was that a discussion when this painting appeared? It was. And in fact I think it's a discussion that not only 
that, that not only be, begins to really sort of very consciously break those taboos, um, but it also sets up what will eventually, in, in about 50 years, become known as pop art. And that this, this, this idea of actually looking to our new um, industrial culture, our visual industrial culture, and saying, what is the place of that world in, in the realm of fine art? And well, didn't Duchamp do that before pop art? He did, absolutely. He was kind of the first. What, what is the J.O.U.? What do you think that's all about? Well, the JOU um, has a couple of different meanings, as, as I understand it. One is a reference to the French word for game. Well, it's UA. That's what I thought. That's to right. play. That's right. right. That's exactly what I thought. And the second is, those are the first three letters of the French word for newspaper. Journal. Precisely. And so if you read this, um, the JOU, you can actually read it in a very literal sense as a kind of rolled up newspaper on a table. Um, but it, it also, of course, has that double entendre and, and suggests that it's that the entire painting is a, is a is a is a kind of play or playful. Yes. So what we're looking at is a tabletop. Um, but if we look at the pictures on the left of um, a cafe, tables with chair chairs with chair caning, those tables are round. So. So what's the problem? That this is an ellipse as opposed this to This is an, an ellipse. Over. Okay. And what, how, how do you get an ellipse? You get an ellipse by looking at a circle from an oblique viewpoint. Go to the, to, the next, to the next image, one forward. And now you know that the table that you're seeing on the right is, in fact, a perfectly round table. But we're looking at it obliquely. We're looking at it at an angle. And so we're actually seeing it as a kind of ellipse that Picasso is offering us. So is it possible that we're actually looking at a kind of glass-topped table? And in fact, what we're seeing as chair caning is the chair that slipped underneath it. Oh, what a neat way to look at the painting. <laughs> That's really cool. But so why take apart all the forms that are on top? You know, what, maybe, you know, we're looking through the table, we're thinking about, you know, the idea of looking through the table and the table is glass also suggests an idea, an important idea in Western art of the painting being a window into a world that looks very real. But on the other hand, Picasso's, like, making it really clear that he's, not looking at things illusionistically. He's looking at these, you know, the uh, objects on the table from lots of different points of view at once. And you're seeing everything simultaneously without any kind of distinction. Everything's been flattened, so they all share the same plane, almost. And, and, then, and that's, that's, that's an interesting, disconcerting way of looking at it. I think you're both right on target. Where he wants to show us the, his entire visual understanding of of this sort of place, this event, um, and so he's not just giving us the the tabletop. He's giving us the tabletop with the chair and all of the objects really deconstructed, so that they include not what he would see from a single perspective, as you said, but what he would see in his full visual understanding of each of these forms over time with his visual memory. So what we have on the table apparently is a clay pipe. And you can see that right below here. Here's the bowl of the pipe and here's its stem down here, which is obviously leaning right up over the newspaper, almost intersecting that newspaper. And then over here, that's a little bit more obvious. We've got a detail over here on the right. You can see the segmentations of uh, some citrus. We put a lemon up as an example, but it's being cut through by the knife. Can you see the blade of the knife? Hmm. Where's the blade more like of a the cleaver knife? than a knife. That's right, more like a cleaver than a knife, right? This would be the blade and this and this here the handle. Ah. Um, and in between, of course, the newspaper, the pipe on the left, and I'm sorry, the, the newspaper and the pipe on the left and the knife and, and the lemon on the right is a, uh, is a, well, can you make it out? Where? This. Or, this and, and everything above it. Go straight uh, up. A bottle that, of wine? Um, a glass. A glass. A piece of stemware. So a little bit like um, what we had on this table. That's right. If you look at the glass of red wine, you'll see um, not only this wonderful kind of reflectivity in it, but you can see the the lip of the of the top of the glass. You can see the the plane of the top of the wine, and then of course the stem and the uh, and the base of the glass. And if you go back over to let's see if we can zoom in on the, the central glass. Maybe by going forward. I think if we go back to the painting, 
that we had in the beginning, I'll see it. Okay. Okay. So now, if 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 we look at this carefully, um, you can see here down at the bottom um, this kind of wonderful ring. And can you can you just imagine that now as the as the base of the glass? Um, that it's resting on. But if look at it. We're looking down at it, and then look at this line that's more horizontal. Is it possible that Picasso's taken a second viewpoint and we're looking across at that? This sort of thick object, the stem, the base of the stem, the bowl from a s several different angles, and then looking at the top, looking across the top, and then looking down at the top here. So basically what we're looking at is a painting within which there are multiple viewpoints of different objects, and they're all fused together. But uh, I have a couple of questions about the rope. Is the rope literally a rope? It is a real rope that Picasso actually went to a rope maker and had specifically custom made for this, to fit it, this it's, canvas. It's funny that you have the rope containing something. It's the one like literal container of something that seems so uncontained in a way. Everything inside of it seems you don't know what's holding it together and it's the rope itself functions as as some glue to keep it all together. It literally bundles it, this mess together. It does together. bundle it and then has the literal, when you show this painting next to the tabletop, it's the one literal reference to the table, to that, I guess it was a silver edge to the table. I think we've seen in sort of the sort of um, theme restaurants, the sort of seafoody places, right? Right. Um, tables with, with ropes around them. But I think the rope really is a problem. I think it's a kind of question as to why. It seems it, like it doesn't fit. Yeah. It there, seems like an attempt to domesticate something that's not domesticatable. And it, but does it point out the, the some of the conflicts that exist between the, the oilcloth of the chair painting inside and the, and the literal rendering through paint in the in the sort of cubist portion of the painting in the top, um, by showing the sort of contrast between the evident reality of the rope and the and the space of the of the of the view within it, and sort of very consciously sort of setting up something that's clearly actual and tactile against something that is sort of purely visual. We have a lot of levels of reality. I think Plato would have had a lot of fun with this because we have the real rope, we have the real chair caning, um, oil cloth with the chair caning Which has an illusion which of has chair an illusion of chair caning. Of chair caning right? Right. And then we have the painting which creates <clears throat> a kind of, in a way, probably a higher level of reality by showing all viewpoints at once instead of a single viewpoint, a sort of greater or, or almost divine reality. And Wouldn't this be wonderful as an actual tabletop <laughs> as opposed to a painting? That would be fun. Be too you would put a little, just a pane of oval glass on it and it would be fabulous. It would be, It'd be fabulous. a lot more fun and I bet you pay a lot more attention to it. That's right.